Good morning. morning. My name is Kyle, and I have the honor, honor and privilege to share with you this morning. You've probably heard it said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But is it really... I mean, really, come on. Like, if you're going to be honest here, if we weren't at church, if the pastor wasn't right there, if you were going to get shamed by the person to your left or your right, would you really say it's more blessed to give than to receive? About two or three weeks ago, I was on uh, the UC Davis campus. Our uh, college ministry, Catalyst, has weekly worship gatherings there. And we were setting up for the night, and there was about 150 students waiting right next to us for a midterm. They had scantrons in hand. You could tell they were crash studying their notes because they hadn't studied enough in advance. They were trying to get that very last equation crammed in their head so they'd have it for their midterm. And in the middle of these 150 students preparing for a midterm and Catalyst getting set up for our worship gathering, I get a phone call. The phone number is plus eight four space something something something. I'm like, what is this? Maybe a telemarketer, I don't know, and for no good reason, I just answer, I say, hello? The person says, hello, is this Kyle? I'm like, yes, this is. Who's this? It's your Uncle Barry. I'm calling from Vietnam. Are you watching this? Now, to most people, the question, are you watching this, seems vague. Like, are you watching what, someone might ask. But if you know me and my family, Every single person in the Thompson family would know exactly what Uncle Barry's talking about. He's talking about game five of the NLCS. <laughs> He's talking about how my Dodgers, you can hate me for that later, how my Dodgers have just taken a five to one lead and we're about to go to the World Series for the very first time in 29 years since Kurt Gibson hit that miraculous home run in 88. My very first youngest and most fun sports memory. Are you watching this? I said, no, I'm not watching it, but I am following it on my phone. Um, And he said, "Um, I'm about to buy tickets. Do you want to (laughs) go? Do I want to go? Are you kidding me? Do I want to go? Yes, I want to go. I'm going to go to the World Series with my Dodgers for the very first time in 29 years. I am running up and down, bouncing like this, spinning around in circles, hands up. I'm high-fiving every single person in Catalyst, and all of my college students have run, are done high-fiving all of them. So now I'm going up and down that line of 150 students who are high-fiving these strangers, and they're like, leave me alone. I've got a midterm. I'm stressed out. I go to UC Davis. I'm like, I'm going to the World Series. But when that little wicker basket passes me on Sunday, there is no, woo, I'm tithing, woo, we're giving generously and in faith and God's going to do great things. It's like, woo. (laughs) Never happened to me. (sighs) Is it really more blessed to give than to receive? I wonder the story we tell ourselves is when we receive that gift. I want to know what the story we tell ourselves about money when it comes to giving. What is it that happens in my head and heart that shapes my experience around giving and receiving so differently? The question I think we all need to ask ourselves this morning is this. What story do you you tell yourself about money? What story do you tell yourself about money? What is the narrative in your head that shapes your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors? What story, what narrative do we have around money? And that may seem like an abstract question to you, but I think it shapes everything you do. I think it shapes all of your decisions. It shapes your relationship with God, is what is your narrative about money? You might go, what are you talking about? Let me explain why I think this is so powerful. Um, I grew up uh, with two parents who came from very simple means. Uh, My grandpa on my dad's side was a truck driver. Uh, Grandma stayed at home and took care of the four kids. Very, very simple, simple life. My dad, similarly, he's one of six kids raised by a pastor, and the six of them lived in an 800-square-foot parsonage right next to the church while grandpa was literally building the church brick by brick uh, with his own hands. And they came from this very, very humble beginnings 
to build what would become a very, very profitable business. They built a boarding care facility for elderly folks. They went from zero to 200 full-time live-in clients that they provided for. And they did what every entrepreneur does. Every smart person who works hard makes money, and it was time to sell the business. They go to sell the business. This is in, in the late 80s, early 90s. So they would go to sell the business for $3 million. Inflation adjusted, that'd be about $5.5 million. And they go to sell it, and they're dreaming of all the things. They said, we've done all this hard work. Now we get to take our money and go cash in and retire early. Until they found out that the people to whom they sell it, were selling it were crooks. So they cancel escrow, they cancel the purchase agreement, and go to take control of the business again. Licensing believed that by entering into a sales contract, we had forfeited our license to operate this board and care facility. They kicked 200 elderly people onto the street, and in three days, we went from being multimillionaires to bankrupt. A few months after that, I'll never forget those, everyone has those vivid childhood memories you can never forget. One of mine is standing out in the street and looking into my house and realizing my house was the only house that didn't have a light on inside because we couldn't pay the power bill. And these two events are what shape my narrative around money. For some part of me, there's this entrepreneur that says, smart people who work hard make money. But there's also this scared little kid who says, it's all going to run away. It's all going to go away. I might run out of money. And there's these competing narratives that I have. I don't want to tell you that both of them are unhealthy. The narrative that we have, most of us in the United States, of smart people who work hard make money, what that does is it makes us self-reliant and self-righteous where we trust ourselves more than we trust other people. And what happens is when we have money and others don't, we think, oh, we must have done something that they didn't do. And that works until difficult times come. And when you've been the one that's been for, there to provide for yourself all the time and you're no longer to be trustworthy, you feel hopeless because you have no other source of hope. But on the other hand, the, the, the fear that we're going to run out, that there's not going to be enough money, that I won't be able to have enough to buy that house or live through retirement or send my kids to school or whatever the anxiety may be, makes us afraid, it makes us scared, and it challenges our trust in Jesus. It challenges our generosity. So this morning, I want to offer a new narrative. Not one of self-reliance and not one of scarcity, but a new biblical narrative that will shape the way we understand money. If you have your Bible, we can go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, Deuteronomy is one of the five books uh, uh, of the Torah, of the law. It's essentially, it's the last book of the Torah. It um, comes from a Greek word meaning second law. Essentially what it is, is it's Moses pulling the Israelites together for one final pep talk. Imagine this. Imagine the Israelites are a football team and they've done their entire season and now they're going to play in the state championship football game and Moses brings them all together and says, hey, hey, hey. Remember what we've done. Remember what we've practiced. In the book of Deuteronomy, the word remember appears 16 times. He's saying, remember the games that we've won. Remember the practices that we've had. Remember the plays that we've run. Just remember what I've taught you and you're going to be okay. That is this narrative that he's setting up. Remember what God has done and you will be okay. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. This is the narrative that the Israelites have around money. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant, then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful. Do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery. In the future, when your sons and daughters ask you, what's the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell them this. 
that we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. But the Lord has brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and on Pharaoh and his whole household. But he, the Lord your God, brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. Remember that you are slaves in Egypt and God brought you out. The narrative that the Israelites have around money is walking backwards into the future. Let me say that again. Walking backwards into the future. Now some of you say, wait, wait, wait that makes no sense. Some of you are like, I know how to walk. That's not how you do it. You walk forward. You look to see where you're going to step, and then you step. And you see what's in front of you. You're like, oh, I know what's coming. That's a safe place to step. Don't walk off the edge. Woo, I'm smart. I'm going to walk forward. But for some reason, God says to the Israelites, don't do it that way. Don't walk forward into the future. He says, walk backwards into the future into an unknown that you can't see, know, or predict, walk backwards <clears throat> and look back. Look back at when you were enslaved in Egypt and God, by God's mighty hand, rescued you. Look back to that moment where the Egyptians chased you and you were trapped up against the sea and God, by a miracle, split the sea and you walked through and you watched the waves collapse on the Egyptian army and conquer them. Walk backwards remembering when you had no money, God literally made manna rain from heaven, bread from heaven, carbs from the sky, and you were happy. Remember that time, water from the walk, rock? You can just walk backwards because you don't know what's going to happen. It's impossible to know what's going to happen. Only God knows the future. It's impossible for us as mere mortals to know what's going to happen. But we know that the future is secure because of what God has done in the past. This is the narrative that God wants to give you this morning. It's one of walking backwards into the future, trusting God with an unknown future because God has been totally trustworthy in the past. And this will change the way we see money. And my fear this morning is for most of us, this is not our narrative. I'm afraid I know the narrative that most of us have around money. Let's take a look at scripture. Go back to verse 10. I think this illustrates our narrative around money and how different it is from the biblical narrative. Verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells, again, you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. The narrative here, what Moses is telling the people, is remember what God has done, and remember that it wasn't you who did it. Which I think is 180 degrees different than the narrative that the majority of us tell ourselves. Most of us say, I have because I went to graduate school and got a good job. I saved my money and built that house or bought that house and it's in Davis so now it's worth a whole lot more money than it was before but it's because I saved that down payment. Oh, oh, I'm going to have enough money for retirement because I'm a good money manager. I've set money aside and put it in that mutual fund and now I'm going to be fine forever. The narrative that most of us have around money is that functionally we are God. We went out and made it. We're the ones who provided it. We managed it, and now we are trustworthy because we did it on our own. Not a single one of you say, hey, this house, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I didn't buy it, just God gave it to me. And I'm afraid our false narrative is a narrative of self-righteousness. And self-righteousness says this, self-righteousness says that I have because I Versus the narrative of Christ's righteousness says that I have because God gave. I have because I. 
versus I have because God gave. Throughout Moses' instructions to the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy, he warns them over and over and over. He says, remember what God has done and do not forget because you're going to be tempted by idolatry. In chapter 6 through 8, there's three different paragraphs, one in each paragraph that warns the Israelites not to go into idolatry, not to trust any other God but Yahweh, the one who rescued them. And what do they do in chapter 9? They worship a golden calf. They go, how is that possible? Because we all seek idols. We all seek sources of safety, security, and provision outside of God. Things that we can control and do in our own power. Because it's so much easier to trust ourselves than to trust God. But the problem is that leaves us powerless when things go bad. And it leaves us self-righteous when things go well. See, this is part of the problem of the competing narratives that we have in our head around money. And I still wrestle with these narratives. Because as a kid, I had the power turned off at my house and we almost lost the house that I grew up in, I still have this fear that maybe, just maybe, we could run out of money again. But then I remember, oh wait, no, look, God provided. I remember when I was 18 years old and going to, uh, to college, 17 days before I was supposed to start school, my financial aid fell through. I was going to have to change my entire life plan. And God provided I remember when my wife and I were pregnant with our second child, Noah, and found out the house we were living in in Davis was no longer going to be an option for us, and we had to find a new place to live. So me and my pregnant wife went looking, scouring houses in Davis to buy, to rent, and anything. We realized, we, 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 this is impossible. We, we, we can't do this. Until we got an email from a realtor that we'd never met, found a house that was for sale two blocks away that we'd never seen because for some reason the real estate agent listed it in New York instead of Davis. <laughs> and for some reason it cost 60% as much as all the other houses on that street. And I said to Sue Vigay, I said, uh, if you know Sue, I said, Sue, this, this, this house is a borderline miracle. She looked at me and said, Kyle, there's no borderline about it. It's just a miracle. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Because I always forget that God has provided, and then I always move into fear, and God has always provided for me. And so now there's these competing narratives that I live with one of God's overwhelming faithfulness to me, and one of my scarcity. One of I have to do it in my own power, to another one that says, My God loves me enough to provide. And I still live in the tension of those competing narratives. So it's changed the way Kelly and I give. My wife and I, uh, the way we have chosen to give uh, is through what's called automated giving. Essentially, one time a year, we sit down and say, how much are we giving to the church this year? How much are we giving to other organizations? And one time a year, we sit down, we go on our computer, boom, done. Never have to forget, never have to remember it again. Why? Because I don't want to have enough faith every time that basket comes by. Because most Sundays, I may have enough faith when that basket comes by, but there's some Sundays where I've got to do a house or a car repair, and I just don't know if I have enough. There's times during the holidays when we're just, maybe uh, we've been buying gifts or whatever, and cash on hand is a little low, and I'm like, I just don't know. But what we've figured out is it's best if we only have enough faith once a year and then trust God the rest of it. <laughs> and you're laughing. You're like, Kyle, you're a pastor. You should have more faith than that. I know, I agree. I totally should have more faith than that. But this is the power of the competing narrative. The devil saying it's all on you or it's all going to run out. First, the narrative that says, look at what God has done. You see, as, uh, again, as Kelly and I are trying to figure out how much are we going to give, we came to this realization a few years ago that for many of us, this idea of giving a tithe, giving a 10% was like high bar, five star, top of the line. That was a goal to shoot for. And we essentially said, if God told Israelites, who are essentially peasant subsistent farmers, to give 10%, 
how much more could we in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world give? And for us, we said it was no longer good enough to say, we're going to try to give 10%. There was no way I could look at God the Father who gave me life and Christ the Son who died for me and say, God, I know you gave me 10% or I know you gave me 100, but I'm just going to give you 10%. It just wasn't good enough. Because I realized that was a way of self-righteousness of trying to say, what do I have to do to be in control of this? And God slowly said, what I want to do is pry from your grasp 1% by 1% every single year. And what we did is year after year, we said 10 is our minimum baseline. And for each of the next five years, what's going to happen is we're going to give 1% more every year. Some to the church, some to other causes that we're passionate about and committed to. And we went from 10% to 11, to 12, 13, 14, and then we got to 15, and then all of a sudden, we got pregnant, and we went from two incomes to one, we're like, I don't know how to do this. And that moment, we said, God's been faithful in the past. Is he going to quit on us now? My spreadsheet loving brain did not love that decision. (laughs) But to this day, I'm so glad I did it. Multiple times I was almost scared off. I said, oh, it's not going to be enough. This is a story of the Israelites. This is my story. But let's not forget University Covenant Church. This is our story too. Some of you were in the room when this happened. Some of you were not. So let me tell you essentially the rough version of the story. Back in the early 2000s, our church had experienced significant, significant growth. People were coming to faith and being baptized and following Jesus and giving their lives to Christ. And all of a sudden, we were in this little building in Anderson, and it just couldn't fit anymore. And we loved this place in Anderson Road, but we're like, oh, what do we do? Do we build a new building in it right, right here and just make it bigger? Can we knock a wall out and make it big enough so that we can all fit? Do we stay just the way we are? Do we maybe go to the entire opposite side of town, spend millions of dollars on a new piece of land, millions of dollars on a new building? And there's the question of what do we do? And in the midst of discerning and deciding and the congregation trying to sense, what is the Holy Spirit? What is God leading us to do in this moment? Dick and Barb Lindholz stood up in front of the congregation, two founding members of the church, and they said this. This church was started decades ago with six couples, six young families, graduate students and recent graduates who in faith believed that God wanted there to be a church in Davis like this church. Before they had a pastor, those six families went and bought a piece of land and said, we believe that God is calling us here to do this. What seemed crazy They stepped out in faith and said, we're going to buy it. So then when the move from that place to this new place created stress and anxiety, wonder and worry in our congregation, Dick stood up and said, God has been faithful to us for over 30 years. Do you think that God is going to quit on us now? And what happened is it triggered our memories as a church to say, oh, that's right. God's been incredibly faithful and generous to us. And the same God who provided in the past will provide in the future. And our church decided to live into that narrative. Our church decided to walk backwards into the future, into a new place, a new building, new opportunities, new challenges. And we've seen, even just like we see today, we see lives continually be changed by the gospel because we led into new challenges and opportunities, trusting not that we were good enough and smart enough to figure it out, but because of the faithfulness of God, we could take a risk and we knew that God would catch us. You see, let me be crystal clear. I know it looks like, oh, it's always about money, money, money. And I want to say, no, 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 no. It's about your trust. It's about your heart. It's about knowing that God the Father has been so generous that he gave you breath in your lungs. That Jesus, his son, gave his own life for us. And the Holy Spirit, day by day, gives us the ability to love, trust, and follow him. And you may say, Kyle, I know you just want our money. I'm like, no, 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 I don't really care about your money. Because I know that God wants your entire life. And for many of us, money is a significant part of it. 
Maybe you're like me and you don't have any struggles about worries about money. That's awesome. Next series is coming. But if you're like me and you're like, no, <laughs> money has a whole, big stranglehold on my heart. Either A, because I think I made it myself, or B, because I think it's going to run out. I want to invite you into a new narrative, a narrative of God's provision and you responding in generosity. Not saying, hey, have I given enough, but one that says, I can never outgive the generosity of my God. That is the narrative that Jesus invites us into. Let's pray. Lord God, search our hearts and reveal to us the story that we tell ourselves and give us the faith to live into a new narrative, a new story of your faithfulness and your provision, a new humility that trusts on you and new levels of faith that give because we know we can never outgive the giver. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.